Tonight we welcome Megan Abbott for her latest novel, Give Me Your Hand. Megan Abbott is the Edgar Award winning author of nine novels. The most recent, You Will Know Me, was a best book of 2016 from NPR, Wall Street Journal, The Washington Post, Publishers Weekly, and many others. Her writing has appeared in the New York Times, The Guardian, The Wall Street Journal, and others, as well as in multiple collections, including the best American mystery stories. She's currently a staff writer for HBO's The Deuce, as well as ad working on adapting two of her novels for film and television. <laughs> Give Me Your Hand is a claustrophobic, tense, visceral suspense full of blood and rage and the complex secrets and obsessions of brilliant women. The male-dominated environment of scientific research serves as a menacing background upon which the darker places of the female psyche and the female body itself are cunningly explored. As reviewed in NPR, the best part of this slow-burning novel is that just when you think you've seen the explosion, another one happens. And you definitely won't guess the last, no matter what foreshadowing exists. Now, please join me in welcoming Megan Abbott. Thank you. Oh, this is so exciting. I've always, I've, I've bought books here many times, but never been here. So I'm really uh, delighted to be here um, to talk about blood um, and, uh, and rage, um, which is sort of of the moment somehow. I don't know. Um, um, so um, uh, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the inspiration for the, the book and then just read a real short section. But I'd mostly love to hear your questions. Um, uh, about, about anything at all. Um, so the idea for uh, "Give Me Your Hand" came from this really small thing. I mean, I'm a I'm a lover of true crime. Um, since since I was a kid, I was that weird kid that liked to read those true crime paperbacks with the crime scene photos in the middle. You know, you know, you, there's a few of you out there. Come on. Um, uh, I just was always fascinated by it. But so I I read a lot of it. Um, and one of my favorite um sources for it is uh, Texas Monthly. Do you, any of you know Texas Monthly? They, Texas has the best crimes. We all know. Flor, Florida is pretty good, but Texas is uh, the best. But I was reading a, a long form piece in there, um, and it was there was just this tiny detail in it that um, so, sort of I became fixated on. And the story was uh, two high school students, two girls, were studying Hamlet together, um, and one of them confided a secret to the other one. It was a, it was a pretty dark secret. Um, and the girl who heard the secret was haunted by it, and she told her mother, and her mother didn't believe her. Uh, but the girl couldn't get it out of her head. She didn't know what to do. So she started to have nightmares that her friend uh, was chasing her through the forest like a horror movie, and she would wake up and hear her, her friend breathing in her ear uh, and it affected her um, so much so that ultimately she went to college and she was sort of had panic attacks um, so it made me start to think about the nature of secrets uh, or confessions how the confessor or the secret teller often feels better after telling it but the recipient now has to carry that burden we've all been on both sides of that uh, I'm sure no one here has ever done anything wrong but but uh, but we've all had someone tell us something that that's heavy and especially if you've been told something that no one else knows um, so it becomes this albatross around our neck um, so the story sort of haunted me and of course the forever English major in me loved the fact that it was the reading of Hamlet that inspired it all in fact it was Claudius's if any of you know the play Claudius's soliloquy uh, where he confesses uh, to his dirty deeds is what is what led the one of the girls to confess to the other so that was just uh, that was just fascinating to me I couldn't get it out of my head and so I, I that's how I came up with the book and I came up with Kit and Diane, who are the two young women in the book, um, Kit is the narrator, um, and they are high achieving women who met in high school. And as Kit puts it in the book, we were friends if Diane is friends with anyone, but only for a few months and long ago. Uh, so it's not it's not the most natural friendship. Uh, Kit, our narrator, is she's very bright, but she's a pretty regular high school student. But Diane is brilliant. Uh, except 
except she's a loner. She doesn't really fit in. Um, and they become lab partners. And Diane encourages Kit, who's less sure of herself, to pursue her talent in science um, at a time when, you know, and this is still the time, but uh, many girls and women aren't as encouraged or don't feel as, as comfortable venturing into science. So, so Diane really fires up Kit's ambition. They become study partners. They spur each other on. And then Diane tells Kit a secret. And uh, Kit pulls away. They graduate. They go their separate ways. But Kit remains haunted by it. We meet them again a dozen years later. So the book toggles back and forth between the two. And Kit's working in this high-profile, very competitive lab. And she's just about to learn who's secured this coveted spot in an exciting new NIH-funded uh, research project with her mentor, the glamorous Dr. Severin, um, when suddenly Diane, who she hasn't seen since high school and is now a rising star in the field, reemerged. She's like this ghost uh, floating back into Kit's life, um, like, like Hamlet's father. Um, so she's a ghost and also her competition. Um, and I became really interested interested in lab environments while I was researching the book and the, and women in science um, who are still the minority, uh, especially in what they call the hard sciences. Um, but in developing the story, I had to figure out what it was that they'd be studying, um, what this tantalizing research project would be about. And I wanted it to be a women's health issue because uh, that's sort of a fascination with me. Um, and that's when I came upon the idea of PS. MDD. Do you, any of you know what premenstrual dysphoric disorder is? A few. Yes. 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 Um, um, so it's it's you might hear it called extreme PMS uh, or uh, I've heard it called PMS on steroids, uh, but it is debilitating among those women who suffer from it. And it and it's long been a controversial diagnosis. Um, there's all these people that have always stated it is a biological condition, but there's other people who called it into question and and said this may sound familiar that it's all in women's heads <laughs> and. Uh, uh, um, it doesn't exist at all. That it's confused with um, depression or bipolar disorder, um, or some have argued that it's uh, anti-feminist because it feeds into various stereotypes about women as being overly emotional, unable to control their feelings, uh, incapable of having their hand on the red phone, so to speak, uh, or because it pathologizes women. So so I, I got really into all of this. Um, none of it, which is in the book, by the way, but I, I, uh, uh, that's my research technique. But um, but I, was, I did want them to be studying something about with the fear of the female body being out of control. Um, and then last year when I was still writing the book this new NIH study uh, proved that women with PMHD, PMDD have an intrinsic difference in their molecular, molecular apparatus for their response to sex hormones. So in other words it's definitely not just about emotional behaviors that they should be able to control but it's about how their cells respond to hormones. So in the study, and excuse me because I'm going to sound like I know anything about science, but I don't but I pretend to when I write books, um, but they turned off estrogen and progesterone, and the women with PMDD reported that their symptoms completely went away, and then when they turned it back on, the symptoms came back. So that was sort of the, the proof that it's not just women having a bad day or being overly dramatic, but that, that it's biology. Um, so I, I'm not an expert in PMDD, though I've heard from, you know, the book just came out today, and I've heard from maybe 100,000 people on Twitter about, uh, about their feelings about PMDD. But, uh, uh, but what fascinated me about all this is how PMD got tied up in all these sort of centuries old issues about women's bodies, the fear of the female. Um, and it got me really excited uh, because it is primarily a book about women's minds. Um, and, and that was a way in. So I thought I'd read just something from the very beginning, which sort of sets us up with Kit, the narrator. Um, and this is when she um, Find, find, Diane is about to return into her life after not seeing her since their high school days. We take our seats around the battered conference table waiting. PMDD is a disorder that affects 3 to 8% of women, read Zell from the re research pricey, adding with a faint jeer, and I know them all. 
Dr. Severin thinks it might be closer to 10%, says Maxime, that it's underdiagnosed among the women better at controlling it or hiding it. They all look at me, as they do when everything, anything ever related to the female body comes up in the lab. Well, Alex jumps in, thankfully, if men could get PMDD, we'd know all these answers already. I can't help but smile, even as Zell rolls his eyes and makes a jacking-off gesture with his hand. Uh, in front of me is a packet of the case studies that have been circulating among us. I can't stop reading them, like the old police blotter magazines my grandfather used to keep in the basement. The British woman who stabbed a fellow barmaid to death, another who fatally pinned her boyfriend to a telephone pole with her car, the teen who set fire to homes all around her drowsy suburb, the woman in Texas who attacked her sleeping mother, beating her with a hammer until she died. All these laid at the feet of PMDD by canny lawyers enthralling the tabloids, titillating the public. Those are the extreme cases, bless you, um, but they're the ones we discuss in the lab. Um, and I should add that Kit's the only woman in the lab other than her mentor. Uh, they're easier to talk to, these extreme cases, than the average PMD patient, suffering her slow burn of monthly anguish, crying jags, bad thoughts, worrying, boomeranging all day, the crushing thunk of insomnia, lying in bed, sweat-soaked, waiting for the blood to come. So, Owens, Zell once asked me, reading from one of the studies, have you ever sobbed for six hours because your cat looked at you funny? This is one of the question years if you have PMDD. Uh, do you find yourself consuming entire pound cakes before that time of the month? Have you destroyed all your relationships because you can't manage your emotions? What relationships, I wanted to say. My head down over my work for the past decade, a doctorate by age 30 doesn't happen any other way, I told my mom. I haven't had any time. And I'd never even suffered from cramps. But since I'm the only woman other than Dr. Severin, and we never talk about it in front of her, I'm supposed to know more, know differently, know something about the purple marrow of female rage, the fear all men have that there's something inside us that shifts and turns, a living thing, once dormant, stirring now, and filled with rage. Yes, yes, she is saying, her slender blue phone as she strides into the room. It's Dr. Severin. Dr. Severin doesn't waste time on anything, including greetings, pleasantries. When she does, they are delivered with mild contempt. Can you see what her folder says, whispers Zell? But I won't look at him, at the moisture blistering on his pimpled prodigy forehead. Is it the grant budget? Do we know who it is? Do we know who the slots are? They're all waiting to see who's going to be on this grant, um, who's going to be working with her. But none of us want to be caught looking, and instead we ponder the long conference table. We play it cool. We put our fingers on it. It's old wood clouded with coffee rings. Occasionally, I sneak a glance at Dr. Severin, that face so long and severe, her mouth always brightly colored, today's lipstick I would call placenta red, and, and teeth white as a shark. She moves with the brisk efficiency of a general, and no one has ever seen her eat, drink a cup of coffee, or hold an umbrella. Sometimes, as I squeeze coffee from my shirt cuff, or chew through an entire pack of gum in a single hour, or dig into the burn gouge on the toe of my low-top sneaker from that time Zell spilled sulfuric acid on me, I wonder how it is I'm here at all. But it was no accident. Dr. Severin plucked me from the masses of pedigree doctoral students, the only one who's ever come from her undergraduate scholarship pool, the only one with a bachelor's from a state school at all, the only one with a laptop that wheezes like a wind through an accordion when you turn it on, the only one with a second job, cater waiter, much less a third, tutoring until she got me more fellowship money. At the original interview, Severin claimed she remembered me from that scholarship ceremony years ago when she handed me the check in a cloud of perfume, the click of her heels on the spit-shine stage. You were the only one with a serious face, she said. Once I spotted an age-brown photo on her desk. A girl with slack 
black pigtails who might have been a young Dr. Severin, cowboy hat and cutoffs and hooded eyes, biting into a piece of fried rattlesnake. Somehow it fits with her now, her python boots, her zebra-streaked hair. She rarely speaks to me, but occasionally winks in a way that might be a facial tick, but I'll take it for something else. I've been around strong women my whole life, and I know their ways. Yes, she says, got it. We all watch as Dr. Severin finishes her call. No goodbye. No, we'll talk later. She slides the phone into her smooth leather folio. Sitting down, she trains her eyes on us, settling in her chair, neck gliding back like a satisfied snake, its gullet thick with warm mice. <laughs> um, <laughs> forgot about that. Um, I have some news, she says. Then her eyes drift to a paper in her hand, and we all wait again. They think they're going to find out which of them is going to be on this grant. We wait. We wait. Finally, I blurt out, what is it? Everyone looks at me, and Severin does that twitch that just might be a smile. We're going to have a new addition to the lab starting tomorrow, Severin says. All our eyes blink in unison. What does that mean? What does that mean about the slots? What does that mean about the grant? Don't overthink it, she tells us, but in that instant, we already have. No one says anything. We know we'll confer and hush the sides under the fume hoods later over honey buns at the rust-pocked vending machine. And she's a catch, Dr. Severin adds, setting her paper down, looking over, I swear, at me, her eyes with those strange vertical slit pupils like a cat's. A she, I think. We're still. It's a she? I swear this is true. The second before Severin says her name, I feel it. I feel it under my fingernails, feel it buzzing in my ears. How can I know? I can't. I haven't heard or uttered the name since high school, but I know. Her name's Diane Fleming, she says. Harvard. I poached her. Snatched her right out of Walter Fridlinger's wrinkly old hands. Um, and that's... That's the uh, that's the beginning. So so Diane here is returning, uh, and Kit has not seen her uh, since high school. Knows this secret. They're in this competitive environment, and some bad stuff happens. <laughs> um, um, uh, so so that's sort of the premise. Uh, and and in the I have to confess right before we start, and I want to hear questions for you. I did write this during the um, last presidential campaign. Um, so there, it definitely sort of sunk its way into the book in certain ways, which is really interesting. Um, but uh, I really wanted to write about a lab environment. And I'm, I'm not a scientist. I talked to a number of scientists scientists uh, before I started writing it and um, you know, I wanted the women to be in competition uh, and I started do any of you here work in a lab or come from a science background okay okay so what I heard about was this thing called labotage which is sabotage what they sort of a nickname for sabotage and labs so everyone is in competition in this case like with kit they're postdocs, they're making very little money, high stakes environment, and uh, sometimes people would mess with each other's work uh, and, uh, and uh, they'll sabotage it and they would call it labotage. So all the scientists I talked to, um, none of them were involved in it, of course, but they all they all had heard stories. Uh, and so that was sort of my way into um, knowing that it could be a, a great, a great uh, place to tell the story. Um, and, uh, and, a, and a lot ensues, but it was also a way to talk about um, female ambition which is is maybe sometimes still an uncomfortable subject it felt like it a little bit when when i was writing the book because of what was happening on the national stage um and uh and also it's it's weird because of course the book was long finished before more recent developments uh but it's it certainly weirdly felt like it was all sort of in the air because it is a lot about women working in primarily male dominated environments and and ideas of complicity and all of that so what i had intended to be and is a thriller lots of you know stark stuff happens and uh uh, uh had this sort of weird building resonance that was that for me at least that was interesting um so 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 that's 
that's the basics of the book, but I would love to talk to you about it, hear your questions, and let me open it up. Who will start us off? Oh, thank you. You don't have to clap. <laughs> Come on. First, yes. Yes, you. <laughs> oh, right. It's a microphone. Sorry. So I feel bad because uh, this primarily uh, concerns something else you've written. That's okay. But, uh, sure. I just recently read that uh, really good piece you wrote, I think, for Slate in the past couple weeks about uh, rereading uh, Raymond Chandler yes. uh, post Me Too. And, uh, you know, given uh, how these sort of things look in hindsight, would you ever uh, do another period piece? Yeah, that's it. Uh, thank you so much. No, and, it, and I think it does relate in some ways because I, I, uh, I, I did think a lot about uh, So I wrote this piece. Uh, Raymond Chandler is a big inspiration to me. He's really why I started writing crime fiction. Are, have any of you read Raymond Chandler? Like the big, we, yeah, wow, wow. You're pretty, you're pretty well read. <laughs> um, <laughs> But uh, I love him, and uh, and I had read a piece in the New Yorker that Katie Waldman had written, a very good piece, but it, uh, in it she talked about how she couldn't believe that women she knew would still enthrall to misogynists like Raymond Chandler. And I, uh, I, so I wrote the piece in response to that, not not necessarily disagreeing with her a little bit, but but about how. Um, how hard it is in this moment we're in where we're reevaluating all this stuff that's important to us and are we just supposed to toss out stuff that is problematic um, and my, my piece was sort of arguing that instead uh, noir for instance the tradition that Chandler practically invented is actually a place that you might go if you want to learn anything about toxic masculinity because it is about gender. That's what it's about. And it's very illuminating. And uh, so that's just a long setup to an answer. But uh, um, it's weird because uh, uh, after I wrote that, I got approached by the Chandler estate. And, they, you know, they're doing these Marlowe novels with different writers now. And they said, would you be interested in, in doing a Marlowe novel? I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not because I don't love Marlowe. Marlo, but it, it just seemed like a like I don't want to walk into that viper's nest. Uh, um, but I would I would do historical again. My first four books are historical, um, uh, and I will keep reading Chandler. I think that this stuff is all important, and we can't forget. Uh, the past any more than we can in the present and uh, and I actually don't think Chandler is misogynist or his character I think the books are about a world in which it's very troubled in terms of gender it's, these are books that were written before during and after World War II there's a lot of you know there was a, there's a lot of gender anxiety men going off to war women going into the workforce, men coming back traumatized and women in some ways feeling women had taken their jobs and had possibly been with other men. And, and like, that's sort of one of the arguments why film, film noir springs from that. So um, all of it's been on my mind. And the, and the piece is like, am I being complicit by supporting and sort of recommending Chandler to people? Um, and, and of course, I guess I'll regret I'm, I'm not, but <laughs> but uh, but it is something I thought I've been thinking a lot about with this book because it is about like it, uh, what do you do? Um, do you just dismiss all this stuff? Do you just refuse to be a part of any system um, that has uh, problematic issues? And uh, I mean, I, I I don't think we do. I think we engage with it and we keep the conversation going. So I don't know if I answered your question or just went on a tangent. Oh but no, that's that's great. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Thank you for reading the piece. Of course. Thank you. Other questions? I've just started reading it, so I don't have an answer, my own answer yes. on this. But was there something about science as uncovering secrets of nature that drew you to that as a work environment? Because I thought, wow, it takes a lot to learn the science when it's something. Yeah. Why would you pick that? Was that right. part of it? In I asked to myself that a lot when I started it. Like, why did I pick this? Uh, you know, because I, I, I wanted them to be in competition in what? And I, I've written a 
several books about women in sports, and I, I couldn't go down that road again. And uh, and then I thought, wow, it would be really hard to write about an intellectual competition, you know, like the life of the mind. And uh, and I and I started to get interested in science, but I I this is how basic I started. Uh, and I was a good chem student in high school, but you know that was the last of it, you know. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I um. I talked to a couple scientists to get some basic research, and my first question was literally like, you're standing at the lab bench, what are you doing? <laughs> like, I didn't even literally know what you would be doing. So that's where I started from a point of exact zero. But, um, but then I did become very, like, over, maybe overly fascinated in trying to understand it, trying to read the... Uh, you know, this material on PMDD. And, but my in was really that, that there was these stories of these women who were suffering, so many women, and no one was believing them. Um, even though, so, and, and this, you can't, this wasn't a, like the medical establishment didn't believe them there, but there were some doctors did believe them and some didn't. And, uh, and I was sort of haunted by the fact that a week out of, Every month, their lives were taken over by this, but nobody was helping them or knew how to help them. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was really kind of how I found my way in, and that mm -hmm. that brought it to a human level to me. And then, um, and then I just started to read everything, and uh, and then actually I had to take maybe at least. 30% of it out of the book or you would be reading a medical tome. <laughs> uh, but then I had then I had a scientist fact check it for me oh. and she flagged a few things oh. thankfully. <laughs> but, yeah. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Hi there. Hey, I know you. You do. I didn't know you lived here now. This I do. is my friend Ross. <laughs> she was a great teacher. We two, I we taught I taught Raymond Chandler, right? Yes. You yes. Did. Misogynistic <laughs> Raymond Chandler. My complicity um, began long ago. <laughs> having obviously followed you on your path to oh. today. I I'm always curious the difference between working independently on a book yeah. and working in a room with I'm gonna assume very set in their ways, men who are used to writing, um, talking about the deuce. Yes. Um, can you talk a little bit about the differences and maybe something positive that surprised you about the collaborative process? Yes, yes, yes. So I've been, uh, I was a writer on the deuce. So I, yeah, it was, and it was very intimidating. I will never forget the first day another female crime writer, Lisa Letts and I, we, we were both hired to work on the show. We'd obviously big fans. Uh, and we, we had to, you know, we knew it was going to be David Simon, George Pelicanos and Richard Price and us <laughs> and, um, and uh, we had to walk around the block three times to get our nerve up to go out there because these were I had met David before because uh, as I'm sure many of you know his wife is a crime writer a wonderful crime writer Laura Lippman and I knew George a little bit from crime fiction I never met Richard Price and we were very intimidated and we were uh, we were supposed to represent women um, so uh, it was hard you know and that actually like it felt like a lot of pressure. You, we can't just hang back or no one's, you know, this is a show, if any of you have watched The Deuce, it's about prostitution and pornography. So if if there's no women talking in the room, you can imagine how things might go. <laughs> but it was actually turned out to be great and they wanted us there and it was a very lively um, and and we we actually watched porn together at one point because we had to uh uh it was the first first uh hardcore movie which is a uh, which is a gay porn movie called uh boys in the sand and we all watched it together it was a great bonding experience <laughs> i think lisa and i are the only ones who made it to the end but <laughs> um, uh, and, but it turned out to be great and it was illuminating how comfortable it could be and that it you know the hard part for me really was that not that they were set in their ways or anything related to gender, but that I'm used to writing by myself and I can do whatever I want, at least until I give it to my editor. And then I'll, then instead I have talked to eight hours and, you know, a day sitting around this table, 
uh, and arguing about stuff and being, you know, it's a very shouty room. And I'd heard that. I, I think The Wire was a famously combative room. And we we didn't have any fist fights except for that time I took Richard Price on. But uh, no. <laughs> um, uh, uh, but that that was hard, sort of having to be on and ready. And that was not, not, sent, not you know, it was nice to go home at the end um, just to be qu- my quiet apartment. <laughs> <laughs> were you working on a book at the time, or is it? Try. I mean, when we would have, we we would go for stretches, and I couldn't. We had so much research because it's set in the seventies. We would get these sort of volumes of research on, you know, um, law, pornography laws and policing things and Times Square zoning and you know, and uh, and and Lisa didn't read any of it because that's how she operates. And I, as the perennial good student, felt like I had to read all of it. So I couldn't do any novel writing then. So this, so this was sort of written in the interstices of that. Um, uh, and uh, and yeah, so it, but it would be hard to make the transition too because TV writing is imagine. very different and it's structured very differently. Um, so it's been a little toggling. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Hi. Oh, hi. Um, the research in your books is evident in this book, in gym, the world of gymnastics, in the fever. <coughs> so they're very specific to what you're writing about. But I'm more interested in the research or how you come to write about young women Mm -hmm. teenagers and young women as well as you do and what strikes me most about them is they're very full characters i i saw someone comment that you passed the bechtel test which you do (laughs) um and i'm just fascinated about why you got interested in writing about young women and what you learned and how you learned it and do you go talk to real young teenagers and young women to find yeah. out what makes them tick because yeah. i've got two daughters if you want to add right to that. no i always <laughs> look for more people to talk to you know it is it is strange you know i first start because i was writing those historical no- noirs and uh and then i did make this pivot and at first it, it felt very natural um somehow because noir operates as this high pitch uh, there's very high pitch of emotion. Every, stakes are very high in noir. It's desire, it's ambition, it's greed. It's sort of big feeling, and and that you know that is how I felt as a teenager. You know, everything is big, and everything matters a lot. Um, and so it felt very natural. But then once I started to write about it, I I did start to remember the stuff that we sort of have amnesia about, which is you know how mu- how that yearning for experience but but always being not quite equipped to actually deal with the experience when it comes you know and that sort of perennial cycle in that age where you have all these firsts um and then that sort of disillusionment after all of those and it's sort of i mean i guess i'm fixated on because when you really figure out who you are and more importantly who you're not going to be you know you're really making all those decisions but i i uh I mean, I don't not talk to teenagers. I love to talk to teenagers, but I, I didn't want it to, I, I never want to be um, too timely, you know? And so I always try to avoid in my book, there are like people have cell phones and teenagers text, but I, I never want to lean too hard on that so that it feels too, because it will change by the time the book comes out. And, you know, we're, we're about to shoot the pilot based on Dare Me, which is one of my books. And, and we've talked about that a lot, about not, like, once you do that, you you make it about teenagers at that moment. When there's so many eternalities to teenagers, I mean, the, everything is faster now, but the feelings are not that different. And there was a big change. When, you know, when I was a teenager, and I'm sure many of you, you, you could go home at the end of the, if you had a bad day at school, you could go home and you could turn it off. You didn't have to deal with it till the next day. You didn't have to think about it at all. And that's gone forever. It goes with you wherever you are now for teenagers. You know, that phone is with you. uh, And 
uh, and your, you know, your social world is there all the time. And, and so that I've definitely want to account for, but the, but the rest of it, I try to, I try to focus on that stuff that, that doesn't change. That's kind of always there. Um, and, and, you know, uh, and to, and also to not do too much slang, which is the other thing, <laughs> um, because that like, you know, you're, you're an idiot. If you like, like, yeah, I mean, I'm an idiot if I'm going to urban slang, which is this website that, you know, uh, to find out what the teens are talking about, and it's always at least ten or fifteen years old, you know. So I try to focus on the uh, stuff that that doesn't change. I don't know if that quite answers the question, or, you, or if I just kind of danced around. It. <laughs> no, I think there is a evergreen nature to what you're writing about, even if it's set in a specific. Well, your timing is just good. I read the. Um, you will know me just before the Olympics. So, I know, and it was you know. <laughs> it was I, the book was supposed to originally come out, I think, in March, and then uh, and no one had thought maybe we should not have it come out till the Olympics. And <laughs> it was like, what a great idea! And it, it ended up being perfect timing. And um, and and uh, I and this it's sort of more unfortunately perfect timing because I didn't anticipate all the Me Too stuff <laughs> and. Uh, but I do know so many people who have books coming out now that they were writing the last few years. And it, I think it's all in there. Like we were all, it was all coming forward, right? It was bubbling beneath the surface. And now it's sort of like the return of the press. Now, now it's just everywhere. <laughs> there is no escape. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know who was first. Oh. Um, so I'm a high school English teacher. Oh, and, boy. Yeah, I know. And um, we actually talk a lot about getting uh, young girls interested in the sciences and the maths yeah. and how much a problem it is and, and what can we do. Um, had, did you have that in mind a lot when you were writing this, like that sort of cultural issue with – young women interested early in this yeah you know. yeah i thought about it a lot. i even reflected back on my own uh experience someone asked me last night were you a good science student my impulse was to say no but but i actually was but i could never thought mm -hmm. like no one i mean and my teacher encouraged me but it was just nothing that you you did women uh, girls at that age this was the 80s uh it was it would have been very unusual there were girls who were doing it but they were they were scant and um and i've sort of followed that i used to work for years as a not a nonprofit in new york in a in a low-income primarily immigrant community and there was a we, it was a big effort to, to 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 get the uh we had a stem camp uh and and it really was the goal was to get girls to go to the stem camp and and because it could really change their lives and so that was on my mind that is a, a feature in the book because that is Kit who sort of comes from a sort of working class background and, and she probably would not have ended up pursuing it all if it were not for Diane who who's comes from more privilege and has more confidence in it so I did want to kind of build that into it um, and that their mentor is a woman becomes a sort of factor of like how they kind of create this um, this little try to help you know like how we lift we lift each other up in, in these worlds and uh, so that that it was very much on my mind and it's amazing that it's still so hard but it oh is. yeah it's still such an issue <laughs> and the attrition I think is maybe even the hardest part because a lot of women will go into the sciences but but then um, at a certain point um, it there's a lot of pressures in terms of not hiring women at a certain age because they think they're going to have children they won't give them the, the these spots and there's just so many ways at which mm -hmm. to get pushed out to so the women scientists I did talk to man they were some hard women bet, they were I awesome bet. I mean <laughs> they had seen it all so awesome yeah awesome. and we, you will see that the English uh, class plays a major role oh I'm excited I can't wait to read it <laughs> hey, thank you uh, hi. That, first of all, I'm so glad you've written about this condition because it's oh, yeah. it's so real. I mean, you are going to get <laughs> bombarded. I, I, yes, I ha yes, I, I I I already people I know who had never told me they had oh, it. Yeah. You will. It's real. Just for anybody here, and if you're married to anybody who has it, you know it. I mean, there's they, support groups for oh, spouses. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, and and uh, yeah, they uh, they. My uh, sons and my husband always said it's st PMS stands for pass my shotgun. Cause that's, <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, it's so real. This yes. was, um, 
But and I also worked in the Office of Women's Health, and this is a huge breakthrough that they found this. So yes. I'm really glad that you've, yes. you've done this. Yes, and you still—it's still hard to drown out the, the dismissals too, oh. even with that, which is it's hard evidence. Oh yeah, yeah, it's real. Um, but um, but I love your writing, and I I mentioned to you I love uh, there's a your short stories as well, but there's a short story in a Hopper book that, that uh, you wrote about a Hopper painting, and it's the best short story in the whole book. Thank and you. you just detest the man in the story. <laughs> it's, it's called like Showgirl or something. Yeah, yeah. And, and the way the woman gets retribution is just so awesome. I mean, you just Thank really, you. really... I should add, I love men. <laughs> I, I know. Well, yeah. And I know yeah. a lot of the male writers in, on The Deuce, and they yes. all adore you. I mean, the, the difference in that show because of the female writers is, is really awesome. If you haven't watched it on HBO, it starts again in September. But um, but so you've got your screenwriting and TV and and your novels and short stories. I, I was wondering how different it is for you to write a short story as opposed to the other two. Yeah, um, I find short stories the hardest of all. I mean, I guess because they're sort of. Uh, there's no room for error in a short story, you know. Those who read who them know they're uh, they have to be gems because everything kind of has to be perfect. And in a novel, you have so much more room to move around and screw up and fix it. And, uh, uh, but what I do love about the short story, like that story, in fact, it's the first story I ever wrote where there's not technically a real crime in it. I wrote it. Uh, uh, Lawrence Block um, edited it and. Uh, and I said, "Is this okay? Because I don't have a crime in it." And he and he said, "Sure." He didn't care. Uh, but uh, uh, but it, it's what I like doing that. Like I wouldn't have written there. That was not a novel. It, it was about a, an, an instance an incident in a woman's life and it was a great way to sort of dive in and it gives me a way to write about the past it's set in the 1930s um which i you know i love writing about the mid-century or sometimes i've written ones where the character is so bad i'm fascinated by them but it's so bad i would not want to live with that character for a whole novel but it's okay for like a 12-page story so sometimes it's that like or oh, i don't want to live in the world of this book um, so it's good. It's good when you have something you're interested in, but maybe not for a whole novel. That said, um, two of my novels, Queen Pin and Dare Me, were short stories before, and then they became a novel. So I do like it for that too. That you know, eventually you might think, hmm, maybe there's a novel here. So uh, well, it's a beautiful, a beautiful uh, murderous story. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi. So I am always interested in authors' writing routines, and I'm curious, you know, are you a get up really early, do it late at night, strict word counts every day? Um, and I also have a part two, which is, you know, it seems like there are so many great crime writers right now, and I'm curious, you know, particularly women, yeah. who are your favorites, and what are you really, you know, reading and really enjoying right now? Oh, yeah, right now? yeah. Okay, yeah, the writing routine, um, it changed a little bit since doing more screenwriting, which is sort of... You know, because you're more deadline focused, and so you have to kind of turn things around really quickly. But the novel thing, I, I am a get up early person, and I and I can't do. I know writers like Laura Lippman, who I would say is one of the be the best female crime writer, maybe in the in the field right now. Who she will have, and she has a kid too, so she has a reason for this. But she will have her three hours. She will get her words because she's that's all she's got, and then have like a whole life the rest of her day. Not me. I can't do anything all day. I, I can't make a plan or I won't write at all. So I have to get up. I have to basically be at the computer off and on all day, and uh, I'm maybe writing two hours out of that, but I'm like thinking or trying to or avoiding social media or I'll go for a walk to figure out a plot thing or I'll uh, occasionally the, uh, well, um, if I'm really at, a, at a, like a point, like I don't know what to do, I'll, I'll uh, sneak into a matinee of a horror movie, always horror. Uh, and why well, I call this the uh, Don Draper solution, because remember on Mad Men, he would sometimes go see a movie in the middle of the day to get inspired. So uh, 
but uh, horror is good for me because it doesn't confuse me get my head all muddied and it's very sensational um so that but basically i can't have a lunch with a friend i can't have coffee i can't talk on the phone because i'll get out of the book too far um and then at four generally maybe 4 30 i'll stop and I have a glass of wine <laughs> and then i might like look a little bit and this is the joan didion technique i read that she did this and then i felt like i can do this so she uh if she says it's okay she said she would write all day and then she would have like a whiskey and read over what she had written and i i, I don't necessarily do that but sometimes i get a second wind if i had a glass of wine and i get another idea um and i'll write a little bit more but basically that's the routine um tv it's it's different because it's much faster and script writing is faster in terms of it it is a great moment for female crime writers i'm not i'm not sure why um there are various speculation but laura lipman always tana french obviously um I really love Alison Gale, Attica Locke, who uh, her uh, Bluebird Bluebird, which is one of the uh, won the Edgar for best novel last year. It's wonderful, set in Texas. She's incredible. Uh, there, there is so many right now. Um, I mean, I read, um, I try, I read, I read widely across genre, but it is a kind of golden moment. The only time I don't read crime fiction is in the last third of the book, because like I don't want it to you know get in my head you could it's easy to start to to mimic or to get panicky because somebody um will do something that you think i don't know how they did that yeah do you have any writers that you particularly like right now well, you mentioned allison gale and i read her, you had the blurb on the back of her book right? yes and that was the sole reason why i picked that up oh. and i loved it it was such a good book so oh that good was, oh that i'm so glad i think yeah i think she's wonderful and i think there's lots of uh jessica knoll is another one mm -hmm. who's like her books are so she wrote um, uh, Luckiest Girl Alive in her new yeah. book, The Favorite Sister. And, and she's, you know, this is sort of silly, but she's very beautiful and she was a Cosmo editor and she's so uh, uh, lovely in person and her books are so violent and outrageous and fantastic and, and super feminist and and I, and I love it and I, I got it's just you like know. Karen Slaughter when you meet her she's so charming yes. and funny but then she's so dark and I nice. yes yes I, I saw what well, there's this event in New York last week called Thriller Fest which is where all the crime writers come and crime writers among the literary communities is always known Known as being the nicest people, weirdly, and they are. And she's so nice. I I, I spoke with her briefly, and I do think it's because you get it all out on the page, you know. And Karen has a lot to get out. You know? Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, speaking of Alison Galen, I was curious. Well, two questions about the the comic book you did with her, uh, oh, Normandy yeah. Gold. So, how did you divide the writing chores there? And then, was it a uh, a coincidence that it was this sort of like lurid '70s thing at the same? Was it at the same time you were working on the Deuce, or did, was yeah, that just pure coincidence? It was coincidence. We had written so that Normandy Gold is this comic that Alison Galen and I wrote together originally. So it goes back actually. I want to say. 2000 11 or 12 we wrote it for so dc comics was doing a crime line at that time so we wrote it for them then and it was the idea was that it's set in washington dc in the 70s and it was inspired by parallax view and sort of all these great 70s conspiracy movies that we all love but also 70s vigilante movies like dirty harry or taxi driver but we wanted a female hero we wanted to have like a female hero who was like the those male heroes of that time where they don't have like Clint Eastwood or Charles Bronson where they almost, say almost nothing and they just you know just go in and kill a bunch of people and it's just, and we just thought it would be great to have a woman doing that so this it's about this woman Normandy Gold who was a sheriff and her sister who's become a prostitute as sisters do in these kind of stories uh, <laughs> disappears and she goes to Washington to sort of clear it up um, but it just it was because both Alice and I love the 70s movies and are sort of obsessed with them. Brian De Palma 70s movies and all the kind of um, I mean actually it would be more problematic to write that now because it's 
stuff in there. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, it was, <laughs> but it's, um, it was really fun to do. And it, and it was, but weirdly, so DC didn't end up doing the crime line and we sold it to another uh, hard case crime uh, for a comic. And it just happened to come out at the si- same time as the deuce. But for that, we did no research. We just watched a bunch of seventies movies and it was meant to be like fantastical seventies. Uh, um, so it's sort of the, in some ways, the anti-deuce but also uh it's much pulpier than the deuce which is you know much more earnest (laughs) thank you you. any other questions one last question yes Uh, yes uh so you your books you often have um there are a lot about relationships it seems to me um uh, are these women fully realized in your head before you start, or oh, do you discover them as you go along? That's a great question. Boy, you know, I would say um, they're not. They're not when I start. Uh, I mean, generally, often the often have, I tend to have this where like a main character who's sort of more identifiable maybe the good the good girl or you know closer to me you know um and then i often have a character who's um i mean i don't ever think in terms of villains or even antagonists but maybe see the darker character um and uh and then sometimes what happens, and I always think of this as the Deadwood thing. And you watch the show Deadwood. You know how the the sheriff and the bad guy, Al Swearingen, they sort of switch places as the series goes on. And that kind of happens in my books. Like I, I kind of sully my, my good girl. And then I, then I start to like the bad girl and give her more reasons for why she does what she does. And it's sort of my Al Swearingen approach to, to that. Um, but in this case... Um, it's also true in this book, uh, but Diane, uh, usually my dark women are, are a little more operatic or uh, extreme, and she was very mysterious to me, and I really wanted to keep her that way, and I sort of became fascinated by how recessive she was. It's hard to write that kind of character, and... Um, uh, she started to sort of live in my brain in some strange way. And then I really started to see her as a tragic figure. And so she sort of, you know, changed as the book went on. And then always what I have to do is sort of go back and rework the beginning to be fair. But I also do kind of like this, the reader themselves to feel that experience too, where where they think they're comfortable with who's the, the, the good one and the bad one. They realize, of course, there are no good or bad, you know, we're all kind of, I mean, some of us are worse than others, but, but let's be honest. But, uh, but uh, you know, that that was definitely a feature. And then there's a, the character, Dr. Severin, in here, the one who's um, sort of um, the mentor figure she had not intended to I didn't intend her to be such a large character but that I was watching the campaign and w- women in power and sort of anxiety about well, can a woman be in power and that and that kind of fed into it a little bit and sort of seeped its way into the book and I will add that I wrote the last um third of the book after the election and it t- took on a different tenor <laughs> somehow there was a it became more dramatic everything felt as we all know regardless of our sta- our political stances everything felt very big and earth shaped like the ground had moved underneath us all i think we felt in certain ways and the ending of the book took a turn because of that um, but i ended up keeping it so see so you, you know you got to go with what, you know, <laughs> you got to go with what's flowing through you. Yeah, so thank you. Any more? Are we all set? Great. Yeah, I think well, probably, thank you all. Yeah, that's a great place to end. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> right. uh, once again, book.